I want to step back to the 1920s and to that year of 1927 when we first had certification from the state of California for our teacher credentialing program. And since I wasn't alive then, I have to read the script. In 1927, the United States was enjoying the aftermath of World War I, an economic boom, and dramatic changes in fashion, music, and the arts. The University of Laverne's teacher credential program was approved by the state of California. And today, we celebrate the diamond jubilee of that program. Teacher training was the bedrock of the early Laverne experience, and most of the graduates were headed for careers in education. The orange blossom, for those of you who don't know, that was the forerunner of the Lambda, had this to say about a senior in 1927 named Lois Martha Miller, and secret laughter tickled all my soul. Appropriate for a woman who has spent most of her life tickling the ivories. In addition to being a member of the senior class, Lois was also a piano instructor. But probably her greatest claim to fame is she was my aunt. <laughs> now I've done some research. I got curious, Aunt Lois. I wanted to think about how long our family has really been involved with the University of Laverne. So I went back to my Bible, and that is Herb Hogan's history book. <laughs> and what I found was that in September of 1902, a woman named Grace Heilman traveled to Lordsburg, California with a man named W.C. Hannibal. And his family. And his family. Aunt Lois always gets <laughs> <take the> right. <laughs> and by the way, she's also the only person who has permission to call me Stevie. <laughs> but our, my grandmother, her mother, came in 1902 with W.C. Hannibal, so we are celebrating 100 years of family involvement with the University of Laverne. And is the oldest living member of the family right now. And she'll have a few more things to tell me after this. <laughs> I'll add those at next year's <laughs> But we do want to recognize my Aunt Lois Miller, Jakob Thomas. And they 
worked in the kitchen too. And the kitchen was the back of the building on the northwest side. And the dining room was next, and then the auditorium. And the ladies would can many, many cans of fruit and maybe some vegetables and made apple butter. And that was to use in, for the meals and in the winter when it came along. Now you came to the college as part of the academy. It would have been in the fall of 1919. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about your high school days? They were glorious days. We had lots of fun and lots of music. And when I was still an eighth grader, I, well, I had taken, well, I'll back up a little bit. I had taken a few um, lessons, music lessons from B.S. Hall. But we had a pump organ in the home. <clears throat> so I guess I got tired of pumping that organ. I didn't do very well. And so then when I was an eighth grader, and he said, but you sing. Lois can sing. Grace sent her down, <clears throat> down to our lyric club, which meets at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And school in my days, you know, was out at 3. And so I, that's when I started in the music department of the academy. And then when I went to the academy, I started taking music lessons from, from B.S. Hall again. And uh, Mary Blinkenstaff and Beulah Smith and Mady Royer and uh, several of us were taking piano lessons. And we followed a certain course and graduated from the piano department. And I have a diploma that is just as beautiful as the one that gave me the as, as I received when I graduated from the academy. And the at that time, it was green suede and satin orange, orange satin inside. Now you had a recital. Was this your, um, was it a, no, was this a recital in the spring of your first year of the academy? And uh, I think you told me this, 19, May of 1920, that would be 76 years ago that you played this program. Oh, yes. I love the, this Les Huguenots by Smith because it had lots of big chords and I could make lots of noise on the piano. But each of us girls, in order to graduate from the piano department, we each had to give an individual recital. That was our junior year in the piano department. Then we became a senior in the piano department. We gave a group recital and graduated from the department. Now you'll note that Mrs. Hall kept everything. Here's the note of appreciation that you sent her after the recital. Well, well. She made this scrapbook for Professor Hall at his retirement in and 1937. It's wonderful that she did that. I have some of these pictures, but they're not put together. But this has every program pictures of as many people as she could find. Now that's interesting. You said when you saw this picture that wasn't the dress you had at this time. Tell us about that dress. Now where did we see the proof that it was well, older than in the year? In your annual for 1922, 23. Did I have that dress? Oh, this is the Academy. This is the Academy. Oh, that's right. We didn't wear robes in those days right. and caps like I do now. Then that was my graduation dress. From, and I weighed more. See, I weigh more in this picture. At that time, during my teenage years there, than I ever have since then oh. or, or before. But, see, I was spending so many hours on the piano. I was starting to say bench. We didn't have a bench in those days. It was a piano stool. But I did spend a lot of time on the piano stool, yes. But, Enjoyed it. Now you graduated from the Academy in 1923. And I believe we graduated, our graduation exercise was in the gym. I think it probably was. A lot of events I noticed were held in the new gymnasium. Yes. It we was were, about three years oh, old. Yes, then. we were in. And uh, doesn't she have a program of that? I played a piano solo because about that time, there was an estate five contest in Pomona. So of course, B.S. Hall sent me <coughs> to go and play. And uh, I would have received a pretty good rating, I guess, if I wouldn't have forgotten one whole measure, made up something, you know. 
and the judges picked on that. There were three judges, and they said, you, um, you made up too much. <laughs> well, and I forgot, I just went on, you know, until I got, got back. And remember, it was a Chopin number, it was a Chopin ballad in, in uh, three flats, and the middle went into four sharps. So that's why I forgot, I got excited. <laughs> Now then you came back in the fall of 23 in the college and graduated in 1927. Yes. <coughs> what are some of your memories of college days? Well, I didn't see many of the sports events because when I was a senior in high school, some neighborhood mothers said, can Lois uh, teach my Johnny and Mary? Give piano lessons? And Grace said, yes, send them over. So my Saturday filled up, and so that's where I got the, this dress <laughs> with my own money. And then when I was in the, at college, uh, every Saturday was full of neighborhood piano children. And then when I was a senior in college, President Studebaker said, uh, Lois, can't you bring your class to the college? and then take some of our college students? Sure, says Lois. <laughs> but the children didn't follow because they didn't want such a raise in, in price, you know, for the lesson, because coming to the college, they'd have to pay instead of 25 cents. No, I had gone up to 75, but they'd have to pay a dollar and a quarter. And what's that, a whole 50 cents more? So they didn't follow, but there were quite a few students, though. So that wanted to take piano lessons, so I was busy. Now that's about 70 years ago. You still play, don't you? <laughs> oh, yes. For all kinds of things. Piano and organ at home? Yes. I have each instrument at home. Just a couple of days ago, talking to a couple of girls who were over in the manor, and they can have two rooms, you know. And I said, I'm beginning to get tired of being, just being responsible, you know, for everything in the house, household things. Oh, come on over here, says they. And I said, well, I need room for my piano and organ. I can't give those up. They said, okay, we'll, we'll look around and find a place that <laughs> has a room big enough because there are two rooms and they call them a suite. Mm -hmm. But no, I'm not moving. I have many things to keep and I don't have room for them. Your memories of Lordsburg as a town as you were growing up? So more and more families came. The Dr. Shirk family came and he had some relatives so there was another Shirk family. And it seemed as they came from Kansas. And Jacob Price, well he came before the Shirk family did and bought a big orange grove up there. J.R. Smith came and uh, uh, bought a big acreage of oranges. And uh, the Barnheiser settled up there, but it was orange country. And uh, uh, the, uh, now, well, the Evergreen Ranch gave boys jobs for smudging. And uh, to those boys, they never got their Faces cleaned up when it was examination time in January, you know. <laughs> and that was a great interest to me, the families that came. And they were brethren families. However, there were some other people living here, though, right across the street from my home was the Progressive Brethren Church. And when they needed a piano player, they called on those. And so I played there for them for quite a little while. Now, where was your home in Lordsburg? 307 North E Street, just between 5th and, no, 4th and 3rd. And so our home was right there. It was a 
two-story house, even with a basement. And my mother, like the ladies who made candy food for the college, she did for our family. And we had to, the fruit seller, the seller, yeah, it was a fruit seller. And she gave up the vegetables because beans and tomatoes sometimes were hard to do properly. Fruit was easier, but anyway, that's what I remember about that house. Although it was two stories, the rooms were small. Now, Dr. J. E. Ho had a house next door with big rooms, but he had six children, so he needed many rooms. And the other house, the Barnheiser house, was a big one, and Jacob Price built a big house, and um, Elbow Blinkenstaff had a big one down in the south. Now, what street was that? that the other Blick and Staff lived on. It was the street below where the station is, but to the west one block. And J.R. Smith, when he first came, he lived in an apartment that, upstairs in the near home. Now that's just around the corner on 3rd Street from where I lived. And uh, Where did I see Galen Smith? Sunday evening I ate in the dining room and uh, a young man, young man, said, don't I know you? I looked at him. I said, well, you look familiar. It was Galen Smith. So I said to him, and now his sister lives here, Beulah Smith Brubaker and Harvey Brubaker. They live here. And uh, Galen and I talked about when they first came. And didn't he say they came from Indiana? They weren't from Kansas. <laughs> I think Indiana. Now, do you have any memory of the past time theater downtown? Of the what? Past time theater. Well, now, do you think uh, Grace Miller's daughter, well, more strictly, J.L. Miller's daughter, would ever get into that theater? I don't believe I ever did get into that theater, but yes, it was there. I but we had so many programs in the college, mm -hmm. and we were all involved. Saturday, every Saturday night. I met Galen Smith up at the Edwards Theater dedication, and he said, oh. oh, there used to be a movie theater downtown. So I've been doing some work up there. Yes, that, that's right. It was called the Pastime Theater. And it was where, uh, well, now let's see, what is there now? It's the hardware store. The hardware store. It's upstairs store. on the book with <laughs> hardware. Store. Yes, because my dad's store, well, there was the First National Bank on the corner, mm -hmm. then the dad's store, and then um, the pastime theater was right in that area. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have a picture with just the end of the T-I-M-E. Oh. The sign that was out front. But, you uh, know, well, not very many brethren and children could go to that. Mm -hmm. Maybe Galen could. <laughs> Maybe the boys could. <laughs> <laughs> oh. As you left college, what did you do? Well, when I graduated, I spent one year here in the piano department and uh, enjoyed it very much. And uh, Dr. Ellis Baker said that, Lois, uh, we'll give you a raise. You can live in the dormitory and have board and room. Now give you a raise. I said, my parents will not let me live out of their house as long as I'm in the barn. And so I went down to Los Angeles to the uh, Department of Education and said, can I have a teacher certificate? Oh, you're missing one subject. One subject. Because you see, I didn't uh, have a teacher certificate from the state of California to teach in the piano department. Just because I could tickle the ivories, you know, I could teach the piano, <laughs> give piano lessons. Well, anyway, so I went to, Claremont. Uh, Laverne was not giving that course that second semester of that year, so I tutored over in Claremont in my dad's 1916 Buick. It was really a relic, but it could run. Anyway, and thus I had my, what I needed to get my teacher certificate, and uh, so I, I thought I'd better find a place to then who will accept me as a music teacher? And uh, I went to Pure and uh, had an NFB 
interview, make a bold talk, had an interview, and had a call, all right, we'll hire you. But we can't uh, give you a, a statement yet of, uh, of uh, hiring, what do you call it? Anyway, contract. <coughs> Uh, because we don't know yet what salary we can give you. But I knew it would be not more than 1400 And even in Upland, there's only 1100 for teachers. And this was music. I was going to have this job. That was for the and whole year? For the whole, oh yes, oh the whole year. Oh, now it's that for two weeks, isn't that? <laughs> or one week. But anyway, and my mother heard of this opening down in Imperial Valley. Rose uh, Eversole, who lived around the corner from us, knew about that. Her sister was in the Imperial Valley because her husband was a farmer and she was a teacher. And uh, uh, Rose told Grace, oh, they pay more down there. So Grace sent me down there. <laughs> and because I had not signed a, a legal contract, I could easily get out of Baldwin Park. But I went over personally and told him, I have this other job for $250 more. Well, that's a whole month and a half. And uh, he said, do you know how hot it is down there? No, Lois didn't know. <laughs> but did it matter? Do I have a music job and more money? And uh, anyway, it was a very enjoyable year down there. One well, year, 14 years. And music teachers in those days, see, were special. And I went into every classroom and had music every day in two schools only, just two schools. In those days, I say, went in every day. And so I enjoyed it very much. And then one day they said, we need you to go to these other schools. They had to build a couple more. And so then I was called a music supervisor. Well, when the war came along, and I took time out to have Stanley, we came up here to Ontario. And my husband had a job in that uh, shaky college teaching physics. Well, he's a mathematician. And uh, I thought, well, I, I'd like to get back to teaching, so I'll substitute. Now I'm getting off on my own, but right. not to college. We want to know about This you. is what I did afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so we prepared you, Laverne prepared you to do that. Oh, indeed, yes, and I just thank my parents, and I thank the school, because it was enjoyable all the time when I was in that old building, and our classes were delightful, and I remember many of the teachers, and uh, Gladys Muir was my Latin teacher, and Gladys Muir was my history teacher when I was a junior, and I enjoyed Gladys Muir very much. But getting back down to Raleigh, for two years, I taught going into every classroom. And they said, and they had a couple more schools, a Mexican school, you know, Hidalgo, and it was a big school. And they built a new Weir school, and they said that Miss Miller, we need you going here, hither and yon. And so then I was called supervisor down there. Well, then when the war came along, and Harry, my name was Mrs. Harry Yockham then, and uh, he received this uh, job up here, so we came up to Ontario. And then, as I had mentioned, I thought I'd like to uh, substitute, music only. So, Christmas time, they called me to substitute at Vina Danks, Vina Danks Junior High School. And that was very enjoyable to finish up the music because the young lady who was teaching there, her husband was sent east, he was in the military, she wanted to follow, so that opened up the job more than substitute, well, will you stay here? All right. So then I stayed. And that's when they decided they wanted someone supervising all their schools in Ontario. And I remember the day that Bruce Miller came in and said, now we have this job opening, and uh, will you think about it? And I thought, what? me do this in this big place? I mean, it's so much bigger than probably. Then as he walked out the door, I said, well, consider me a candidate. I thought, dumb Lois, don't, <laughs> don't goof right now. <laughs> Sounds like a nice job. And so that settled us in Ontario. Mm -hmm. But we lost Mary at age 53. The boys were 16 and 11. But I had this 
job that I enjoyed very much, and so that took care of our family. Now, we've talked a little about some of the faculty, and I've turned here to help me remember, and let me name some names and, and find your reactions to them. W.I.T. Hoover. Well, he had the same stack of jokes year after year. <laughs> Isn't that what everybody says? And of course, it was always Miss Miller, Miss Brubaker, but when Lois and I, Lois Ruth Miller, happened to be in the same class, he finally had to say, Miss Lois Ruth, Miss Lois or Miss Ruth. <laughs> but the kids called us Lois Ruth and Lois Martha. And he was the minister who officiated at the wedding of Harry and I. Uh -huh. But Vera and I were very good, close friends, musically and friends. We would walk home from school because I was close there and then she had gone up the block. We'd hold down that corner for a whole hour, <laughs> talking and jabbering and everything. And one time, when the church finally brought in an organ, and Vera and I were the first ones to play it. She probably was the first one to play it. But anyway, one time she said, Oh, Lois, here's a very pretty number, very pretty song. It was a love song. But anyway, and very nice words, you know, in those days. And she said, let's play it as a duet on the organ. So we did. But who knew the song? Laura Hawk. Did she scold Vera because she was the older? She never said a word to me, but she certainly did scold Vera for playing a secular song. <laughs> it probably wasn't the right thing to do, but not in those days. But J.C. Brandt. Jesse Brandt. I didn't have him as a teacher, but I knew the family and I knew him, and I knew his wife, wasn't it Catherine Baumgartner? Mm -hmm. I knew Catherine, she would call me Louis, Louise just for fun, to tease me, you know. But I think that's because we had our books near each other, because we had, in, in a little room in the hall, there were bookshelves, and it wasn't a very big room, and that we could put our books on. So we had to put our names on the shelf, you know. But Barney and I had our books right there together. So I called her Barney, and she called me Lucy. <laughs> Louise. <laughs> Mrs. Hall, Mr. and Mrs. Hall were here for many years in music and drama. Well, tell us a little about Mrs. Hall. Laura Hall, she was a great lady. A lady, not a gal, a lady. But anyway, first let me say I remember as a child, see their house was across the street from us but on the corner, and we were on the other side of the alley across the street. And I remember, so I must have been quite young, because I see Benjamin S. Hall in many pictures way back. Uh, he was the tennis coach. Well, he wasn't the tennis coach when I knew him. But anyway, here was this couple came, and across the street was um, just grass and stuff, and weeds or hay or something. And I remember, well, it must have been some kind of hay because there were haystacks there. So here was this lady sitting in a haystack, telling them what to do, and having her big broad hat, you know, and that was Laura Hawk. And so that was many years ago, but I don't, as I say, I don't recall the year that they came, but I know the year they built that house. And it was a beautiful house. It had an upstairs and downstairs, it had a den, and it had a living room, and it had a big dining room, and they had a big library. Now why I know all of that is because when I was taking lessons on the organ, by a B.S. Hall, because we always call it B.S said, Lois, you can come over and practice on our, our grand piano. And Mrs. Uh, Layuna Hubble next door, Dr. Hubble's wife, she also said, Lois, you can come and play on our piano. But Layuna is the one who told my mother to tell Mr. Miller, get Lois a piano. <laughs> but that's why I knew the, the hall house. Dorothy Merritt. Dorothy Merritt? Oh, she was glorious, and did we have a good time. We put on an operetta. She made up the words, and I made up the music. And Lois Ruth, and Lois Shirk, and Pauline Shirk. No, Pauline wasn't here that year. Lola, Lola and um, they got these young costumes, and we gave uh, 
an operetta that was about spring. Of course, there was a prince and princess in it. Oh, it's real, real nice. And we had a picture taken on the front steps of the dormitory. Did you ever see that picture? I don't think so. Where I surely still have it because I can remember it so well. And then, when I went to Brawley, I used the same little operetta down there. And the, the sewing teacher is the one that got busy and bought lipstick and rouge and, and powder for, <laughs> for the little people who were, well, they weren't so little because in that school there were eighth graders. Hmm. It wasn't just a primary school. Well, when I see that, I didn't see this picture. Here you are on the faculty as piano teacher. Oh, yes, with that permanent way. Wow. And Mary, mm -hmm. she had, she helped in the home. I say help. She was assistant in the voice department, Mary Messimer. And was she? Excuse me, would this still be in the, in the old hotel building? This is 27. That spring was still there, yes. Well, when we were seniors, and in 1926, October 1926, didn't we move to Founders Hall? I think maybe it was in 26. And our picture is in every book because our, my senior class was the last one in the old auditorium. And uh, so we moved to, to Founders Hall in the fall of 1926, then we graduated in 27. Now, where did we have our graduation exercise? In the auditorium there? I assume it was in the new auditorium, because yes. then that summer, or the next winter, they tore down the hotel building, the college yes, building. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, it wasn't in the gym, like, mm -hmm. uh, like the academy graduation was, but that building was new, and we just thought it was really great. Well, it was. <laughs> It had a stage. Now you told me once about the time that when Miller Hall was built in 1919, which meant that the women moved from the college building over there and the dining hall and the kitchen were moved. Oh yeah. What did Mrs. Hall do to the former dining hall and kitchen in the building? Mrs. Hall? Well, the kitchen was large and the dining room was well, I guess it was large too, but it was kind of a long, uh, a long room, right back at the stage. And uh, I never saw, they took out all of the kitchen cooking business, and that became her room. And, uh, uh, but they saw his, his room was right across the hall. That was the music room for many, many years, always. But when the, and that kitchen was not there for 1919. Well, that's right. That's when it had made the change. And uh, I know I thought it was so great on a rainy day. I could stay and eat in the dining room over there, not have to go home. <laughs> Although I only had two blocks to go. <laughs> As you came into the hotel college building, what do you remember of the entry? You mean the old building? The old building. Oh, that was elegant, because those two stairways, because the stairs went up a little ways, and then there was a little landing. You walk across this little landing. So that made, what, what do you call it, the baluster? Banister. Right. The banisters then had a curve, and so it grew graceful. And the steps were, it was wide. So it was very elegant there, and spacious. And of course, when I was going to school in that building, the president's office, as you entered, was the left, and there were two rooms there. And on the right was a classroom. And on around the corner, Gladys Muir's room. Do you know where the library was? It was a, that circular, how do you describe it? The round room? The round room, yes. And upstairs, it was the art room, that circular room. Because in those days, when a china painting was the thing, you know. And oh, they made such beautiful pieces, beautiful artwork. And that was called the art room, too. Do you have any memory of the, some of the students, and maybe it was a little later, had a cadaver, those who thought they were going to be medical students? 
Medical? I had a cadaver up on the fourth floor. <laughs> oh, yes, you heard the story about that. Well, I won't tell that one. You can tell that. <laughs> well, I'd like oh, to know yes. what you know of it. Well, I don't know. Well, uh, one boy, what was his name? Cunningham. Ralph? Was his name Ralph Cunningham? I'm not sure. As far as medical students are concerned. Because in my early days, and um, well, not through college, but in the academy days, the foreign missions was the thing with the Brethren Church. And so I remember Ernest and uh, Sue D. Vanneman and Effie Metzger. And then J.B. Emmert, of course, spent time over there. And Miriam Beria, wasn't she born? In, she was. In India. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody belonged to the mission band. Of course, I did, even when I was an eighth grader. In the mission band. And uh, we had, uh, in those days, the mission band is the one that had the deputation team. So it was usually a quartet. And go to the local churches around here. Then a little later, the deputation teams, uh, and when we were over in Founders Hall, had a regular committee that would uh, get people together and, and train them and so forth. So I was in, once when we went to Arizona, and uh, when I went up north, oh, it was a great trip for me. I got out of California, my word. <laughs> well, it took a while to drive. Oh, yes. Harrison France was the uh, the driver when we went to, to Arizona. And oh yes, and we had to, it took some money too, but then we didn't have, our quartet didn't have to worry about that. And in the quartet that went to Arizona, it was uh, Ernest Carl and uh, Myrtle Butterball and uh, uh, Mark Lamer. But there was only two boys each time. And well, of course, I was on quartets that went around here too, where they picked the music students. And when we went up north, there was um, Harvey Emily and Harvey Rebaker on our quartet, Medina Studebaker and Florence Landis. Well, Florence and I were the girls who went to Arizona. So that was quite an experience for me. But I was strictly a hometown girl. My folks never went on vacations. We didn't do that, you know. <laughs> Your mother was Grace Hyland Miller for many years, the correspondent for Lordsburg and Laverne to the Pomona paper. Yes. And also the correspondent for the Laverne Church to the Messenger. I see her name over many years. Um, she knew a lot about what was going on in town. Yes, she, she did. And we always had food on the table, but our mother wasn't always there. And uh, she did her part there. But, and uh, she never talked about what she was going to uh, do and be and see where she went, but she already told us where she was going. So we knew where she was going. And when she went to Long Beach and when she went to Glendale, Arizona, and uh, even, down, even down to Pomona, uh, the Pomona group was quite a large group of uh, churches and, and Christian education for youth. And of course she was busy in that. As I say, we didn't know what she was doing, but we knew where she was going. But she didn't have time to tell us about it. And I didn't know that she was so good with the handcrafts, but because the time she didn't uh, do it with us, she would do it with her teachers. And uh, some of these girls, Helen Brownsberger, for instance, Helen Brownsberger, ever so. And uh, Miriam Hanwalt Long, mm -hmm. those two gals have told me several times recently how my mother had those girls that were teaching in her primary department, come to her house, you know, and and learn how to and figure out what to do with handcrafts and how to teach the lesson and so forth, and that she would serve them lunch. Now I don't mind laughing about this. My sister and I, we knew. Now you know, when you're real busy and going places, you don't have time to cook the big things. It's always the quick things and so forth. 
and we had chicken every Sunday, and we knew how to do that. And uh, uh, Ruth said she cooked lunch for those girls, so I finally asked Miriam, I think it was, I said, what did you have? She said, we had chicken and dumplings. <laughs> well, that's tasty <laughs> and good. <laughs> But the interesting, if you want a few more ideas about my mother, I don't know how much you know about her early uh, life uh, in her family home. She started teaching when she was 17 in the one-room school. And uh, several of the children were her own brothers and sisters because there were, that's 10, 10 who grew to adulthood. So they went through school, this one-room school. And um, she said to her father one day, I need more training. I'd like to go up here to, um, now where's Junior at College? Huntington. Uh, Hunting, Huntington. And I would like to uh, go and get more training. So she went up there for one year, and then she uh, wrote back and said, I need to stay another year here. That did it. She joined the Brethren Church and very interested in foreign missions but uh, she didn't push that with her father. And so when she came back, her father was so upset about it. I guess he was really furious about it. He said, just don't darken my door ever again. You left the Presbyterian church that I raised you in, and now you have left my church. Now, she never told us this at home. I learned that on my first visit. My husband and I went to Pennsylvania to visit her home. And so her younger sister, Esther, told me this story. And she didn't know too much about the details. She doesn't know then what happened when she went to Juniata. But somebody in one of the write-ups wrote that W.C. Hanwalt knew her in high school days. Now, who wrote that story? That wasn't in your book. Mm -hmm. But he had been acquainted and with And I her. don't think that's in the Gladys Year book. So what book was that? But I didn't know that about. But I did know that uh, he was acquainted with her because he's superintendent of the county. Mm -hmm. Was it Derry County? I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. Derry County, Pennsylvania. And so uh, I, just, I just suppose that she returned to Juniata. And there, the W.C. Hanwell and family were there and uh, probably told her, or somebody told her, go to Elgin, Illinois, and get a job in the publishing house there. And so that's where she was when the Hanwell family decided, when he decided to uh, uh, answer the call to Lordsburg and come out here for the college and uh, stopped in Elgin and uh, brought her along. And, so she was with the Hanawal family when she came out here. Now, where did your father come from to Lordsburg? My father was born in Virginia. And uh, when he was about seven years old, and he had a, a brother and two sisters. The two sisters were younger. They were quite young. He was seven, and Charlie was eight or nine because he was the older boy. And uh, came out to Missouri to Homestead. and. It's pretty rough, and the two little girls didn't live beyond 10 years of age. But this was uh, in Missouri, northern Missouri, and that's where relatives live now. But when he became a man, he uh, uh, went to um, McPherson College. I said, uh, I said to him one day, uh, how did you go there? I said, oh, my father paid my way, and graduated from the commercial department. Now, it probably was an academy rather than a college in those days, because this would be in the 1890s. Yes, his graduation little certificate said 19, 1893. And mother was at Junior in, in 98, 97, and 98. And I have written to, not lately, but I, when I first came here, I got real busy and wrote to. Um, Elton to ask more about my mother there and I talked to Hazel Kennedy and she gave me the name of somebody who's in the historical department 
and they don't find a record of her on the roster. I thought maybe she on the roster of workers. But he found some Sunday school papers of a way back 1902 with her name on the stories. And so Ruth and I prize those very much. Then, oh, or my dad, and Fanestock was it my first in that time. Do you know that name? What's his first name? Well, anyway, and the penman, great penman um, artist, and my dad became a penman artist and went to Citronella, Alabama as a teacher. But how long he stayed there, I think, was very short. And then he heard about the college here in Lordsburg, California, and that's why he came to Lordsburg, because by that time, his older brother said, well, I'll take over the farm, and I'll pay you your share, the little girl's side, so there was just the two boys, and so he had a little money to put up the store, although a couple of pictures I have showed that he was working and uh, making bricks. I guess some adobe was still being used around here in building <laughs> the Spanish homes or something or other. And then also see his picture, lived at that little hotel. Now this is a little rooming house. Yes, it, it, it's next door to what now would be Circle K. Mm -hmm. Just right across the street from us. I, I've seen but pictures I, of it. It was also a home. in that picture, though it's very dim. Uh -huh. But I think, so that's probably where, where he was staying. And then when he got this money, then he uh, built his store, General Merchandise. And then mother became a worker for him, and he told me this himself. Not many years before he died, he said, I owed your mother so much money that I married her. Oh. He told me that. <laughs> and I have a picture of the Laverne Church, the people all in front, you know, and I'm a babe in my mother's arms, so that's uh, 1905. 